All right, take your Bible to say if you would. Um, I don't know, you got that going, Dean? Make sure you give me a little bit extra. Got a little bit of a throat issue this evening. Romans chapter 12, please. Romans chapter 12. Good to see Dan and Karen back safely with us, and uh, glad you're back home. Let's see here if I get this up just a little bit. All right. <clears throat> Familiar verses to us, Romans 12 and verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Father, we ask uh, to add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening. And Lord, as we prepare now once again to look into your word tonight, I pray you'll give me help, Lord, strengthen my voice. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'll give me clarity of mind. I pray, Lord, that the truth will come across in a clear way. I pray, Holy Spirit, you'll minister to the people as they sit in the seats this evening, Lord. As they go through the scriptures, may the word of God be quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. May it profit those who hear tonight because they will mix it with faith as they hear the word of God. And we'll all take you at your word and help us to fulfill the command to be ye transformed. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I want to talk to you now on that subject. Be ye transformed. Uh, Amish boy was visiting the city for the very first time. They were from a little small town in Pennsylvania. And they went into the city and they happened to go to a shopping mall. They were amazed at everything they saw. But especially by two shiny silver walls that they watched come apart and then come back together again. And the boy asked his dad, what is that? And the father, who'd never seen an elevator either, said, I've never seen anything like this in my life. I don't know what it is. But while they were watching with wide-eyed amusement, an old lady in a wheelchair rolled up to those moving walls and pressed a button. And they watched the walls open, and she rolled herself into the elevator, and the walls closed. And then they watched as the numbers began to light up above the door. And they continued to watch until the numbers started reversing again, coming down in the other direction. And then they watched as the doors of that elevator opened again. And a very nice-looking 24-year-old woman came out. And the dad looked down at his son and said, Boy, go get your mother. <laughs> Transformation. That's not what we're talking about, though, all right? But in a way, it's the transformation that we're looking for. Be ye transformed. Number one is, what is the definition of transformation? Well, the word used in the original language for the Bible was metamorpho, or it is to change into another form. To change into another form. We get our word metamorphosis from us, which where the caterpillar comes becomes the butterfly metamorphosis a change it's the word it's the word that was used when jesus went to the mount of transfiguration and he was transfigured he was transformed before them and if you remember in fact uh, hold your finger there in romans 12 and look at matthew 17 with me will you matthew 17 let's go ahead and look at this matthew 17 Verse number 1, After six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. Well, what happened when he was transfigured? What happened when he was transformed? It says, His face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. What happened there, he was transfigured, and, and his face began to shine. And, and his clothes became white as the light. What a sight that must have been. That's transformation. That's tra trans. It's being changed to another form. 
that's what he's talking about for you and me in transformation. The, the, the difference or the change that ought to take place in our life. The, I want you to know that in Romans 12, when it says, Be ye transformed, that's in a passive tense. Uh, in other words, it's not something we're doing, it's something we're allowing to have done to us. Okay? And so it's not something that we have to just grit our teeth and, and try harder. Uh, it's something that we have to yield and let God do to us. He desires to do it. We're, we're only as transformed as we allow God to transform us. It is, it is our will that gets in the way. And we want to do our own thing. And so, when, when we undergo a complete change under the power of God, it's going to show in our character and in our conduct. It's going to show. We're going to, we're going to, it'll be as drastic as a caterpillar to a butterfly. Okay? It'll be that drastic of a change and people won't believe you're the same person. Now, it's only by God's power and by His grace that we get changed into another form. It's not unlike salvation. Salvation is not something we're doing. Something God does for us. What did you do to get saved? You simply asked Christ to save you. Who did the work? Jesus did. What, what change took place in your heart? Jesus did that. You didn't do that. And the same thing is true, the yieldedness and the, the, the willingness to let God do something in our life. That's transformation. That's, what, that's what's to happen as we serve God. That's the change that's going to take place. Now, let's, let's go to number two. And that is this, the goal of transformation. What's the goal of transformation? Why, why is it? Just so we can look different? Just so we can be different? No. The goal is to become like Jesus Christ. That's the goal of the believer, is to be like Christ. We'll say, Pastor, why, how, do you, how do you arrive at that? Well, you're in Romans, so let's look there first, all right? Romans chapter 8, and look with me at verse number 29. Most everybody knows Romans 8, Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good, to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Not very many know verse 29. But verse 29 goes with 28, and he says, For me, whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate. He predestinated us to be what? Conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. So do you believe in predestination? The answer would be yes. But not predestination that some are saved and some are predestined to go to hell. God's predestination is that every one of us who know Christ as our Savior would be conformed to the image of His Son. That He would allow Him to bring about the change in us. Do you understand? For us to be from sinful man to be like sinless Jesus Christ there has to be quite a change that takes place. There has to be a transformation. Okay? Now that happens by here in verse 29. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. How does this take place? 2 Corinthians 3. All right, look at the last verse of that chapter, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. The glass is like a mirror, okay? And, and the, what we hold as we look at the glory of the Lord is this mirror right here, the mirror of God's Word. James called it the same thing. Looking into the perfect law of liberty. How do we see the glory of the Lord? We're looking into His Word. That's how we see Him. Now notice, with open face, we're beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even how? As by the Spirit of the Lord. So who changes us? Who brings about that, that change that makes us more like Jesus? It's the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God. Don't, don't you try to do the work of the Holy Spirit in somebody else's life. 
Okay? Let the Holy Spirit do that. And He'll do it through the Word of God. He does it through His Word. So we are to become like Jesus Christ. Jesus put it this way when He was teaching. In Luke chapter 6, He said, the disciple will want to be like his teacher. The disciple becomes like the one who's teaching him. And that's normal. That's, a, that, that's the way it works. And so we understand that we're, we're to be like Jesus Christ. But that's not all. The second thing is, we're to live like Jesus Christ. Not just be like Him, but to live like Him. We're presenting our bodies living sacrifices. Holy, acceptable unto God. And that's what Jesus did. Uh, Hebrews 10 and verse number 5. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 5. I want you to notice the Bible says this. It says, Wherefore, when He cometh into the world, talking about Jesus, He saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. What is Jesus saying? I didn't come to offer sacrifices. I didn't come to, to do burnt offerings. What did God give me to do? He gave me a body. What's going to be the sacrifice? My body is. Okay? What's our sacrifice? Our bodies. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Well, it's my body. I can do what I want with it. Is that right? Not if you're a Christian, it isn't. What? You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It's not mine to do anymore what I want with it. It belongs to God. I'm to live like Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't come to offer sacrifices or a sacrifice. He came to be a sacrifice. And that's what we're to be. We're to be living sacrifices to God. To prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. We're here to do His will, not our will. And we'll never do God's will if we're not a living sacrifice. If we're not willing to die to ourself. What's the biggest hindrance to any of us doing God's will? Oh, yeah, our will. <laughs> I want to do what I want to do. I, don't, I know God says this, but... Well, I know, I know the Bible says that, but... And then we're going to proceed to say what we think. See? Because our will gets in the way. And that's why he says you have to be a living sacrifice. The goal of, transforma of transformation is, is, the, is really the goal that every Christian ought to have. To be like Christ and to live like Christ. Why then why is it that most Christians are not transformed? I wish I wouldn't have to say that. But that's the truth. Most Christians are struggling along somewhere between caterpillar and, and, and in between, and they never get to be the butterfly and experience the, the, the beautiful life that God intended for them to have. And... and Maybe it's because they, they lack the proper motivation to do so. Number three that we'll look at tonight is our motivation for transformation. Our motivation for transformation. Notice what Paul said again back in Romans chapter 12. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. By the mercies of God. So he says, I'm basing what I'm telling you on how merciful God's been to us. God has been merciful to all of us. But you always look at that whenever he says, therefore, you always look in the Bible to see what it's there for. Okay? And usually it's because of what has gone before. Okay? So let's go backwards a little bit in the book of Romans. What mercies had Paul told them about here in his epistle. Look at Romans 6 with me, would you please? The first mercy I see is freedom from sin. God has been merciful in that He has given us freedom from sin. Romans 6 and verse 16. 
Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Paul well, saying, there's no, no Christian that has to be a slave to sin. You are free from sin. And you're freed from sin so you can be a servant to righteousness. What keeps us from being servants to righteousness? Because we're still serving sin. What do you say in verse 12 of chapter 6? The first three words of verse 12, what are they, church? Let not sin. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Why do you why does sin reign in your body and you obey it in the lust thereof? Because you let it. Plain and simple. Oh, I know. We blame the devil. Oh, the devil did this. Devil. No, 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 no. It wasn't the devil. It was you. It was me. The biggest problem we have, any, the biggest problem any Christian have is probably not the devil. It's the person you're looking at in the mirror every morning. That's the biggest hindrance to your transformation. And by the mercies of God, God says you've been free from sin. You're free because of what Christ has done for us. Not only that, the second thing he says we ought to be thankful for the mercies of God is he's given us eternal life. Verse 23 of chapter 6, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life has a gift from God. Hey, if the wages, what we deserve, if we got what we really deserve from God, we deserve death. We deserve to be separated from God forever in hell. That's what we deserve. Say, God, uh, give me what I deserve. You don't want to say that. No, you want mercy. And mercy says, okay, uh, my son has died for you. Now I offer you the gift of eternal life. Wait a minute, a gift? You mean I don't have to do anything for it? No. You know, you get a gift because somebody loves you and they wanted to get, bless you with something. And they give it to you. And all you do is receive it and say thank you. That's God's mercy to you and me. So He gives us freedom from sin. He gives us the gift of eternal life. Romans 5 and verse 1. Paul says He gives us peace with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have been justified by faith. And that gives us peace with God. But it doesn't stop there. Verse 2 says, we have access to the grace of God. Notice verse 2. By whom, that's Jesus, also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have access into His grace. We're saved by grace. We have peace with God. But, but wait, how can, how can I be gracious to anybody else? Because I have access to His grace. I have access to the grace of God. Naturally, we're not going to be gracious with each other. Okay? Naturally, we get upset with each other. And short. And, 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 and not very patient. But to extend grace, we have access to grace. Isn't that an amazing thing? That's the mercy of God. But verse 9 tells us something else. Chapter 5. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. We're saved from the wrath of God. You're never going to be on the, 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 the receiving end of God's wrath. Hallelujah for that. You don't want to be there. That's the worst place to be. Wow. All these things we've received by the mercy of God. Now what should that do for us? Look at Romans chapter 2, would you please? Romans is an amazing book. Romans chapter 2. Verse number 4. 
Notice God says, Are despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. You know what the response should be to these mercies that God's given to us? It ought to be repentance. It ought to be a turning to God. It ought to be a, a realization of His goodness to me and to you. And we certainly say, God, if you've done all this for me, I sure want to live for you. I, wanna, I want to be transformed. I'm motivated by the mercies of God. But the other motivation is by the love of Christ. B on your paper, I think, is the love of Christ. Paul said, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 14 and 15. Notice what he says here. Paul says in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 5, For the love of Christ constraineth us. It, it means it's, it's, it urges me on. It, it urges me with irresistible power. The love of Christ is urging me with irresistible power. Okay? Yeah, that's what constraining means. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto who? Themselves. Who's, what, who's our biggest problem? <laughs> Ourselves. Not live for themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. The love, that, that love compelled the Apostle Paul to live for Christ. That's what compelled him to say in Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Again, the love of Christ urged him on. It was such a so overwhelmed and filled with the love that Christ had shown to him. He says, man, that motivates me. Nothing motivates you like love motivates you. Sometimes women work and a, a, a secular job or an outside job and, and they get married and then the husband says, I just, you know, you stay home and, and I'll, I'll be the breadwinner and you take care of the house and, and people will come to the woman and say, uh, are you working anymore? No, I don't work anymore. Huh. And how many ladies know uh, when there's dishes to do and laundry to do and cleaning to do and, and as soon as you get it done, it's all messed up again, especially if there's children. And somebody says, somebody will look at some mother with three or four kids at home and say, oh, you don't work, huh? huh? Yeah, about the time you're ready to sling them upside the head with a frying pan, aren't you? Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, you know, the difference? At the one place, you're working for the money, but at home, you're working by love. You're motivated by love. You do what you do at home because you love the people who live there. So you don't look at it as work because it's love. Are you motivated by love for Christ? That's the, the mercies of God and the love of Christ. God's been so merciful to us. Not giving us what we deserve. Mercy. But then showing us how much He loves us. And how much Christ has loved us. So that compels us to live for Him. It compels me to be like Him. That's how God has been to me. You know what? I want to be that way to others. That's what should motivate us to want to be transformed. Now I want you to notice number four. Back in Romans 12. Are you doing okay? We're moving kind of fast. Number four. The only alternative of transformation. There's only one alternative to transformation. Notice what he said in Romans 12 and verse 2. He says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. So if I'm not transformed, there's only one alternative. I'm conformed. 
If I'm conformed to the world, I cannot be transformed by God. Conformed to the patterns of the world. Of course, most of us know that that word conform there is, it, it, it really, it, it's transitory, it's changeable, it's unstable, and that's, that's, by the way, that's what the world is. Things that, are you finding out? We're finding out now that some things that nobody thought was wrong 40 years ago, everybody thinks is wrong now. Okay? Things that, 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 that it, it's just, society changes so much, their morals go up and down, and they change with the times. And, 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 and that's what he's talking about here. We, we, begin to, we begin to get poured into their mold. And we begin to think like they think. We begin to do what they do. We begin to, to, to act like they act. And behave like they behave. We're poured into their mold. When a Christian is poured into the mold of the world, we bring shame and dishonor to the name of Jesus Christ. Some of you probably have read this, and probably Xavier, you know all about this, but farmers in, I cannot pronounce the name of the city in Japan, are preparing full-grown watermelons for shipment. But they're not normal watermelons. They're square. Some of you have seen that. They're placed in tempered glass cubes while they're still growing. And people think, why would anybody want a square watermelon? Well, they're easier to store in your refrigerator. When you put the big round one in there, you don't get much else in there. So they made them square. And, and, the, and, and by the way, the watermelon's square because it grows in the shape of the container that it's put in. It'll take on that shape. That's what the world does. The world wants to put us in its mold and let us become shaped like they are. So those, and I'm talking about the, the world, I'm talking about the, the folks that are lost in the world, the folks that, uh, there, there's a world view of things, the way of looking at things without God. Um, Bob was sharing with us, they, they send a letter out from the office, uh, Representative Young's office, when somebody uh, buys a home in the district that he represents or something, they just send a congratulations letter and welcome to the neighborhood type thing. You know what I mean? I'm your representative. I can be a help to you. But again, congratulations. And he closes the letter with, God bless you. He got a phone call today from someone. How dare you mention God in our secular nation, in our secular society, how dare you say God bless you? How could you possibly? And this guy was just wanting to pick a fight over that. That's, that's, by the way, that's where the world is going. And if we're not careful, we get to think in that way too. And we get to thinking, we, we shouldn't maybe mention that, or we shouldn't say this, or we shouldn't stand up for this. And if we're not careful, we can get where, where most of our problem comes when we conform to the world, it's in our thinking. We get to think like they think. And so that's why Romans 12 tells us, don't let the world shape you. Don't let them grow you in their mold. Don't let that happen. Let God transform you. That's why he said if you're not going to be conformed to the world and you're going to allow God to transform you, how does it happen? Did you read verse 2? It happens by the renewing of your mind. Oh, it all comes back to the way you think. Thinking determines living. When we allow the transforming Word of God to work in us, it produces outward results. God always works from the inside out. And the inside, as He works on the inside, it begins to show on the outside. And, and so the difference is this. Remember, we're looking into the law of liberty. We're looking into the Word of God. And the Spirit of God, where does He reside? In us. And we allow the Word of God in us. Thy Word have I hid in my heart. So I'm putting the Word of God in with the Spirit of God. And the changes, 
I'm letting the inside shape me, not the outside shape me. The outside pressures that come to us. That we better be like everybody else. I better get along with everybody else. I better just, just, just think like everybody else thinks. And, and we succumb to the outside pressure instead of allowing God to change us from the inside out. Why not? Why not let the mercies of God and the love of Christ motivate us to be transformed, to be like Christ? Now, what's the process? Number five is, what's the process of transformation? How's that work? God's doing the work. How does that work? Again, it's a passive process. You're not going to change yourself by your own strength. You're not going to change yourself by your own power. You have to submit to God working in you and through you. That starts at salvation. That's the beginning point. It begins when you receive Christ as your Savior. That's when the transformation process begins. I'm made alive with Christ. I'm forgiven of all my sins, trespasses. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 5. A great verse regarding salvation. Titus 3 and verse 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You see, we're saved by the mercy of God, by the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Romans 6 says we're, we're raised from from uh, being dead in trespasses and sins, we're raised to walk in a newness of life. When you're baptized, we say we're buried in the likeness of His death and we're raised in the likeness of His resurrection. But we could just as well say we're dying to an old life when we're rising to walk in a new life. Rising to walk in a new way. We're dying to that old life. We're rising to walk in a new life for Christ. Now I'm dead indeed to sin, but I'm alive unto God. I'm alive to the things of God. And I'm ready to be what He wants me to be. We've been raised up to live with Christ. So receiving Christ makes us a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's the starting point. Okay? Secondly, it continues as we have the renewing of our mind. The renewing of our mind. That process of tra transformation is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Okay? It's a process we go through. And if you don't renew your mind, any change that happens in your life is going to be very superficial and very temporary. It will not last. Now you renew your mind, and that is where we set our mind... Colossians 3, verse 1. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Okay? He says, as a matter where, where, I, where am I going to set my mind? Romans 8, and, and if you're in Romans 12, Romans 8 and verse 5. Notice what it says. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. Now, you could, you could say this way, they that are after the flesh do fix their attention and thoughts on the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit fix their attention and thoughts on the things of the Spirit. All depends on what you want to think about. What are you going to set your mind on? You've, whatever you feed your mind on is how you're going to live. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It all depends on what you're going to feed into your mind and what you're going to think about. When, you, when those early Christians got saved in Acts chapter 2, they continued steadfastly in apostles' doctrine 
and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. When I, when I say, listen, I'm going to focus and keep my mind on the Word of God and the things of God and praying to the Lord and fellowship with other believers and I'm going to keep my mind focused on the things of God, a transformation is going to take place. A transformation will take place in your life. You'll put off the old man and you'll put on the new man, as Colossians tells us. We'll begin to mind the things of the Spirit. The process of transformation is really quite simple. Set your mind on things above in order to renew your mind. Because what does the Bible say about the natural mind? The natural mind is enmity against God. If you just if you don't purposefully renew your mind, your mind will go against God. That's what the Bible says. It'll be enmity against God. You will not the natural mind doesn't understand the things of God, doesn't comprehend the things of God, first Corinthians tells us. So you're going to be in darkness. So how do we do how do we renew the mind? Well, we meditate. On God and His Word. Think about it for a while. Don't just read your Bible. Think about the Bible. I'm amazed how many times people read the Bible and they don't think about what they're reading. Think about it. Take time to, to, to ask questions and, and, and meditate a little bit on what you're reading. So you grasp what's going on and the truth that God has for you. Number two, keep your mind in communication with God through prayer. We talked about it before. You know, you, 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 in fact, the Bible says pray without what? Ceasing. It means we should, we should be in an attitude of prayer all day long. It doesn't mean walk around with your eyes closed and your hands folded. You're going to be in trouble. <laughs> Bad things will happen to you. Okay? But you can always be talking to God. It ought to be a constant communication. Whatever comes up, whatever situations arise, even if it's a phone call and you're not quite sure how to respond to the person on the phone, it's say, Lord, help me. I'll say the right thing here. Give me what I need. Give me my. If somebody else, a uh, uh, so situation arises or you're driving in the car, you say, Lord, you're driving Columbus, you've got to pray. <laughs> and especially when it starts snowing. And, uh, you, but, but it's all the time. It's one of being constant communion with God. It keeps your mind set on Him. The biggest, one of the biggest things we lose is we lose the awareness that God is with us. When, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, where was God? He's there. He, isn't He omnipresent? Yeah. But they lost the awareness He was there. When Moses killed that Egyptian, where was God? He was there. But we lose the awareness that He's there. And so I want to be aware. What's the, best way, what's the best way to not lose the awareness that God's there? Talk to Him. Keep it ever present in your mind. Talk to Him. Okay? Number three. Involve your mind in, through the assembling with other believers. That's what church is for. You know, church is here to engage your mind. It's not just to engage your body. That's the tragedy of many churches today. They come and they're appealing to the flesh. They're not appealing to people who think. You're supposed to engage your mind. The Lord says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. And you're here to help renew your mind. And then, you can also exercise your mind by telling other people about Christ. That's witnessing. That's soul winning. Tell them what He's done for you. Tell them what He's done for them. That helps you keep your mind on the things of God. Minding the things of the Spirit and not minding the things of the flesh. When you renew your mind, it's possible then to put off the old and put on the new. And that new man is patterned after Jesus Christ. That's transformation. Now, 
what I said before is you have to remember something. Look at the book of Philippians, will you please? Go to the book of Philippians. Are you okay? We're almost done. Philippians chapter 1. We said transformation. When I say be transformed, is it, is it going home tonight and standing in your bedroom and saying, I'm going to be transformed. I'm going to be transformed. I'm going to be transformed. Transformed. I'm going to be transformed. Is that what it is? No. No, that's not at all. It's passive, remember? Who's doing the transforming? Yeah, God is. God wants to do that. It's, he's predestined that for you and me. What does Philippians 1 and verse 6 say? Being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Who begun the work in you? Yeah, Jesus Christ did. God did when he saved you, right? And he's going to continue that work until the day of Christ when you rise to be with him and we go home to be with the Lord. But wait, chapter 2 of Philippians. This is what he means in verse 12 when Paul writes, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. He didn't say work for your salvation. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, how do I work that out? Well, verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. You're a Christian. You know Christ is your Savior. I'll guarantee you this. God is working in your life. The Bible says He is. Now, to what degree he works and that becomes known to others is up to you and me. We have to allow him to work. Does God, does God want everyone to be saved? Yes, he does. He will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Do all men get saved? Why not? What, what do you mean they choose? They don't accept it. Why? Because they have a will. Is it God's will that every Christian be transformed? Is every Christian transformed? Why not? Our will. It's our will. We have to yield our will to His because He's working in us to will and to do. He doesn't just give us a desire. He gives us the power to do it. The will and to do of His good pleasure. That's God. That's amazing. He saves me. And then He doesn't say, okay, now do the best you can. No, he says, I'm going to give you the power. I'm going to give you the desire and the power to live as I want you to live. To literally see your life transformed. From what you were to what I want you to be. The failure is always the will. It's a failure of renewing the mind. Can the, can the mind get renewed on a starvation diet? People... People, you, you never pick the Bible up between Sunday and Wednesday. You never take time to read God's Word and meditate on God's Word and you think your mind will get renewed. Not a chance. Not a chance. You're starving. You're starving it from what it needs to be renewed. Worse, sometimes, you can't renew a, renew a mind on junk food. Trashy movies, trashy music, trashy television programming. We want to fill all the wrong junk into our minds and then think I should think like a Christian. You won't. You won't be transformed. That's why many Christians don't experience transformation. 
How can, how can you know, we, we very few, if, if all I want to do is go to church for an hour on Sunday morning, am I really reading my Bible every day of the week? Most likely not. I hope so. But if I, if I just, if, if the average American spends, I think they said, almost five hours a day watching television. Now, I don't know how much if they've taken into account now with all the, the handheld devices that people can use to watch things and stream things right to their phone or their, their tablet. But how can I spend out of my, you know, if there's, a 106, there's 168 hours in a week, if I sleep eight hours a night, take away 56, that leaves me 112 hours in the week. Okay, if you work 50 hours a week, you still got 62 hours. You really think one hour at church or maybe one hour a day, seven other hours when in the Bible? And then, so that might give me 10 more hours. So I got maybe 10 hours with God and then I've got 52 hours. I'm filling my mind with worldly things. That that's going to transform my life? No wonder where we got problems. No wonder we conform instead of be transformed. Renewing of our mind. Renewing of our mind. We spend more time watching the things of the devil than reading the things of the Spirit. And therefore, we do, we do not end up being transformed. Hey, our attitudes and our behavior are just a reflection of what goes on in our mind. Boy, that got quiet in here, didn't it? We've been called to be transformed in the image of Christ. We have all the motivation we need. We have the mercies of God. We have the love of Christ. We have to allow our mind to be renewed by setting our minds on things above. Will you? Will you submit to God? Will you submit to letting the great physician do brain surgery on you? And get your thinking changed so your living will change? He provides everything we need. The Bible and prayer and fellowship of believers and the church. He's given us what we need. To make it. To fashion a new person. But we have to yield. We have to, we have to give our bodies a living sacrifice. Not, God didn't say, he, he didn't say, are you willing to take a bullet for me? He said, are you willing to live for me? Are you willing to, to die to yourself and live for me? It's a living sacrifice. And you know what Romans 12 told us? That's our reasonable service. After what he's done for us, that's just reasonable that we should do that. When we do that, you know what we do? We prove to the rest of the world what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Because the good and acceptable and perfect will of God for the Christian is to be transformed. Because then we'll be like Christ. And we will live like Christ. And that's what God wants for each of us. Let's stand together, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for this command in Romans and for your desire that each of us be transformed <coughs> by the renewing of our mind. And Lord, I pray that each of us in our heart tonight would yield to you and ask you to transform us to the image of Christ. And Lord, help us to understand this is not a overnight thing it's a process it's a journey you take us on 
And so every day we die to self and every day we yield to You. Every day we must think on things above, not on things on the earth. So Lord, help us, each of us tonight, by the mercies of God, because of the love of Christ, to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. I pray that we'll live the Bible we've been reminded of tonight. And Lord, we'll rely on your power to do so. Continue to work in each of us, both to will and to do, of your good pleasure. Watch over us as we go our separate ways now, Lord. Give us safety as we travel on the roads home. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. 128, I think we do on Wednesday night. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. All right, let's hear you sing. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy, that's why you're happy, that's why we're happy tonight. God bless you, you are dismissed. Choir, come right on up.